tired of the everyday grind? Want to get away from it all? Descent into paradise. Florida. Greetings, everybody, from sunny Florida. Here's wishing you the best of everything. And it's my personal belief that the best of everything comes from right down here. Everybody, it's Steph from JustAdayInParadise.com, and thanks for tuning into this week's episode of Just a Podcast in Paradise. Me and the Dip Crew love living in the Sunshine State, and it's our goal to help you plan for your very own day in paradise. Follow along as we explore the keys, theme parks, springs, and everything in between. If you're new here, be sure to hit that subscribe button so we can notify you when our new episodes are live. If you already love sitting down with us every week, we invite you to support us through Patreon. Just follow the link in our show notes. As you know, we're always going to have a drink with you, and today we're going to enjoy what I'm calling the Black Coral Mojito. We're ready if you are, so kick up your feet, throw on your shades, and let's take a trip to paradise. Welcome to the studio, man. Hey, what's up, man? Sorry we weren't here last week. We were. I know, we missed you. We were on a uh, dip hiatus. Yeah. It's all right. You got to take dip breaks. Very, very brief hiatus. Yes. Very brief. Very brief. Yeah. One week hiatus. Uh, you guys missed Kim from Christie's Key Lime Cookies. I know. I yeah. do like her cookies. Yeah. Me too. They're fantastic they're cookies. Uh, I heard, well, I heard she's going to hook it up with some cookies for us. Oh, yeah. Yes. Ooh. Yeah. Uh-huh. I see them at Oaks Farms all the time. I'm like, I. I, I know. I. Oh. Did you know, I don't know if you guys listened to last week's episode, but we learned that Alyssa uh, shops three times a week for Christie's Key Lime Cookies. That's kind They're literally of essentials. Alarming. <laughs> <laughs> I shop, she has a problem. <laughs> we shop, we go to Publix less than that. Literally. literally. Yeah. I probably go twice a week. We can yeah. get away with once a week, but you know, every now and then. We'll... And it's like, if you want, sometimes you're like, oh, in the middle of the week, I want to make this. Or you're yes. like, yeah. oh, I just want to go to Publix. Yeah, that's ne- that's never happened. Well, I hate Oaks Farms grocery Oaks shopping. Farms, yeah, Oaks Farms is good, but it's like everyone's so nice. Well, sometimes it's a madhouse. How in the there. heck are you ever going to get in and out of there? Yeah, we you always know? do. We were yeah. there for about forty five minutes. The shrimp salad. Saying. You still haven't had the <laughs> shrimp salad. Should we get Alfie Oaks on here? Oh my, yes. oh, I would love that. Three part episode. That would be the best episode. <laughs> First ever. part shrimp salad. Second part that that pineapple. The, pink the dance pineapple. floor. Do you know what I'm talking about? Third part social justice. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Alfie Oaks, if you're listening, you're probably Please not because you're busy. Yeah. Have you Please ever seen a grocery store that becomes a nightclub? Because well, that's what it's here is. in Naples. It's yeah. called Seat to Table. In Naples, if we did a dip tips for Naples, it would be go to Seat to Table because, you know, there's not a lot of nightlife in Naples. It's more day life. Oh. Barely. Uh, so you got you to gotta find those weird things to do, and Seat to Table is one of them. Yes. yes. Yeah. It's fun. They have, like, Latin night. It's okay. Karaoke. It's karaoke. Yeah, right? Am I making that up? That's fun. No, you might not be. They have like a lot of different stuff every night. Gator Nate. He's yeah. a big, big, big uh, Gator. performer. Gator Gator Nate. Gator Nate. He actually okay. does Oaks Farms and Seed to Table. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's uh, let's circle back around to... Enough about last week's episode. Let's talk about this week's episode, yeah, right? Uh, let's circle back to our cocktail of the week. It's called the Black Coral Mojito. I mm. named it that because in today's episode... Boop. We're talking about the Gulf of Mexico. Uh... In the Gulf of Mexico, there is a coral that is named black coral. Mm -hmm. It takes 2,000 years to grow to like full maturity. Wow. I've never heard of it. Right. And it's endangered. Mm. Right? Uh, I heard it grows like, I forget what the actual statistic, but it was like something like a hundredth as slow as your fingernails or something. Interesting. Yeah, it's yeah. like the how the um, the tectonic plates are like moving apart. It's exactly like that. It's how, how like slow it is. Remember when I said platonic plates? <laughs> yes. <laughs> they're, like, we're just, we're just they're just friends. We're just friends. <laughs> I mean, come on. Hashtag platonic plates. So yeah. <laughs> uh, so in honor of that coral that we need to protect, I made the black coral mojito. It's got blackberries muddled with lime juice, azúcar. What else? What else did I say? Club Blackberry soda. club soda. All it is is I know it's and better dark than rum. The it's one. a bubbly, right? It, bubbly mm-hmm, brand. Mm-hmm. It's better than the drink that you made that was just a bunch of small bottles put together. 
Oh. Yeah, what was what did I call that? That was disgusting. Was it trying to get kitchen uh, trying sink. to no, it was <laughs> no, it, yeah. Yeah, it's try, I thought it was trying to get all the small bottles out of our liquor cabinet. Dot com. So, let me learn you. Okay. Um so Florida, we talked about this once before, but Florida ranks second in US states for coastline behind what state? Do you remember? Hawaii? California. No? No. Alaska. Oh, uh. damn. Everyone forgets Alaska. Uh, we have 1315 miles of beautiful blue water and white sandy beaches. Over half of that is attributed to the Gulf of Mexico. Did you Killing say Hawaii? It. Okay, listen, I know it's small. I didn't, I don't know. But it's surrounded by water. Right. I get like the, mo- right. you know. Yeah, you went for. Florida's basically like surrounded by home. water. Right. It's like barely not. <laughs> uh, over half of it is attributed to the Gulf of Mexico. You didn't say Alaska, so you can stop laughing. <laughs> <Except> California, <laughs> at least it's a lot of coastline. But it's half. Coastline. And Hawaii's got all the lakes. It's like so. the size of Rhode Island. Is it? I don't no, know anything don't know about it. Yeah. Listen, maps are very deceptive. I know, they, they are. are. They are. I'm they sorry, are. I got yeah. it. We can get back on topic. <laughs> Megan said, I'll write it me. down. And we'll put it in the show notes. Megan said a really funny thing. Yeah. At minutes, six minutes and 42 yeah. seconds. All right. Uh, oh, <laughs> so the Gulf or the West Coast of Florida measures 770 miles long. 5,095 estuaries and tidy, t- tidy pools. <laughs> Tidal pools. Tidy pools. Tidy pools. Uh, and 19 ports. It's home to some of our favorite beaches. You know, we've talked about them. Uh, beloved wildlife and thrilling outdoor activities. So in today's episode, we're going to be talking to our friends over at Moat to learn more about this amazing body of water, what they're doing to keep it healthy, and how you can do your part while you're here. So stick around. Yeah. Let's go get our friends. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, Garrett, it's time for bed. No, 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 no. Wait, wait. Can you, can, you, can you tell me a story first? All right, one story, and then it's nighty night for you. Do you remember the one about Meggie Locks and the three cocktails? <gasps> oh my gosh, I love this one. Once upon a time, there was a little girl named Meggie Locks. She went for a walk on the beach. Pretty soon, she came upon a tiki bar. She sat down in the bar, and immediately she was served three beautiful cocktails. Meggie Locks can never resist a free drink. She tasted the first one and realized the straw was plastic. No, plastic is terrible for the environment. I can't drink this. So, she tasted the second drink. Gross. The straw's all soggy, and all I taste is paper. So, she tasted the last cocktail. Mmm, this hay straw is perfect. She said happily and enjoyed the rest of her delicious margarita. Well, Garrett, what's the moral of the story? (sighs) That when you use hay straws, all natural, 100%, biodegradable, gluten-free, and never soggy straws, you're actually doing your part to help take care of our planet. They can be tossed right in the compost bin after and will break down naturally and return to the circle that's right, big guy. Good night, Steph. Good night, Garrett. We can all sleep a little easier thanks to hay straws. <sighs> Visit haystraws.com to find out more. So welcome back from our break, everybody. Moat is an independent nonprofit marine research institution comprising world-class marine scientists committed to the belief that the conservation and sustainable use of our oceans begins with research and education. We're thrilled to have on our special guest, Stephanie Kettle, public relations manager from Moat Marine Aquarium and Laboratory, here to help us on our Gulf of Mexico deep dive. Welcome, Stephanie. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Of course, yeah, we're so excited to have you here. We've been wanting to do this episode for a long time because we live on the Gulf, uh, and we know that you guys are experts of everything that's happening in the water, whether it's the water itself or the wildlife. So we're going to pick your brain a little bit today. All right, that sounds great. And uh, let's just call out the elephant in the room. You have an awesome name. <laughs> well, me? Yeah, because mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I have a thing for Stephanie's because I think that Stephanie's are cool. I agree. Um, I have the wonderful curse, though. My parents uh, gave me an extra N in Stephanie, so I'm oh. Stephanie with two N, which uh, is 
you know, is really cool, but also really problematic when I never have my name spelled right. Right. (laughs) That's true. Well, I'll make sure to put the correct amount of N's in our, in our promotion this week. You can add some extra, you can add some extra in there too. I don't mind. (laughs) Just, we'll sprinkle in a few N's for everyone. Okay. That sounds great. Cool. So now let's get to the uh, aquarium itself. So I think most people, myself included, think of Moat the Aquarium. Uh, I love the different exhibits and how you really highlight yeah. how the plants and animals are integrated in the Florida ecosystem. Uh, and I saw you call yourselves guardians of the sea and all living things that depend on it. And you do that through research and education. So what came first? Was it the research lab or the aquarium? Um, I love that you asked that question because this is one of my favorite things to talk about. And, you know, Moat has this really, really, we have a really cool history. Um, so to take it back um, to Dr. Eugenie Clark, who is actually a very well-known um, shark and fish researcher. She, her nickname is actually the Shark Lady. Oh. Um, she's actually the, the founder of Moat Marine Lab and Aquarium. So we actually are, we are research first. Um, she founded Moat actually as a one-room lab. Um, some like to say shack. Some people don't like to say shack, but it was small. I think shack sounds cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, so she founded the lab um, in 1955 um, in uh, Charlotte County, so a little bit further south than where we are currently located. Um, that lab moved up to Sarasota, um, and we didn't have the aquarium part till 1980, so oh. well into our history of being a research organization. Um, and that aquarium was built really because so many people were asking about what we were doing. We needed to tell them and what better way to do it than with a awesome attraction, especially in a, in a town like Sarasota where we have lots of visitors. We have lots of really cool cultural attractions in town. So it just made a lot of sense. And now since 1980, we've been research and uh, aquarium. That's so neat. And you know, it does make sense being up in Sarasota because I don't know if a lot of maybe visitors to the area think of the water when they think of Mm -hmm. Sarasota, but there's so many little inlets. I mean, you can access the water from anywhere, even some of the public parks. Yeah. And you know, I, I grew up in Orlando and I mean, anytime like we would go to the West coast of Florida instead of the East coast, I was like, yeah, we're in for a treat. We're going to see nice water. (laughs) Um, Love my East coast of Florida, but you know what I'm talking about. If you're in Brevard and Volusia, it doesn't look the same as over in Sarasota. Sorry about it. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think that's such a cool part. And Sarasota is such a, and really most of Gulf Coast of Florida, but especially Tampa to Sarasota, this connection between, you know, the community and the water. They, everyone is so in tune with what's going on in the water. And that's what's really cool. And that's what made Moat so special especially when it started as a research organization, the community wanted a research lab. They wanted a marine research lab in Sarasota. That's why they convinced Jeannie to move her lab up to Sarasota because the community wanted it in Sarasota. That's that's what makes, you know, our community so special. And we still have that extremely fervent community support um, to this day, which is really cool. You know, we always love sharing with our listeners about the beauty of the Gulf of Mexico. Some of our b- favorite beach towns are there, like you said. You know, it's got really beautiful waters, really nice sand, and we're even based out of Naples. But for those of us that live around it, for the c- past couple of years, we have been experiencing the effects of red tide. Can you explain mm-hmm. to our listeners what red tide is and what you're doing to combat it? Yeah. Um, so, you know, first we got to clarify, Florida red tide is caused by a microalgae. And let's actually back up even before that. Algae, um, they're everywhere, freshwater, saltwater. And algae are really important. They are plants in the water, so they are creating our oxygen. Um, And so that's an important role in in our, you know, the grand scheme of the Earth's ecosystems. But there are algae that are harmful. They release toxins. And um, it's not a lot of, you know, when you look at percent-wise, it's not a lot of algae, but there is that, you know, group of algae that can really cause harm um and florida red tide is one of them it's caused by an algae called uh its scientific name is karenia brevis and what happens is is when this algae releases its toxin it's a neurotoxin it can kill fish it can Mm -hmm. kill sea turtles and manatees and when that toxin gets aerosolized so waves are kicking up the toxin and they'll aerosolize and then blow on shore in humans it can cause um 
you know, mild to severe respiratory irritation. Um, yep, that's kind what of happens is, to me. Yep, yeah. yep. If you have the kind of the standard mild, it's, it's like a tickle in your throat. Like it feels like something's in your throat all of a sudden. Um, and that's the aerosolized toxin. Mm -hmm. And so with Florida red tide, it's something that is, it's a native species of algae in the Gulf of Mexico. It's always present in background levels. Um, but what will happen is if all the conditions are right, you know, physical, chemical, um, you know, wave currents, all these different conditions, if they're right, it will, the population of these cells will just explode. Mm. And so that's when we call it a bloom. And so now we go from background concentrations, but there's a couple of cells per liter to now thousands, tens of thousands upwards to, you know, very bad bloom, um, where there's millions of cells per liter. Wow. Yeah. And that's when we have a bloom. And so um, the blooms will form offshore and then, you know, waves um, and currents will move it around and bring it near shore. And that's when you really start to see the impact on coastal communities is right. when those blooms get uh, moved inshore and we're starting to see the dead fish on the beaches. We're starting to experience respiratory irritation, things like that. Um, right. So that's just the big overview. We have lots of great um, resources on our website and on Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission's website about red tide as well if you want to learn more. Um, but, you know, some of the things that Moe is doing, we've been um, really heavily involved in red tide research since the 1980s. And a lot of red tide research has, you know, was especially focused on what is this? What is this phenomenon and things like that? Um, and then in the last few years, Moat has really started to lead the way in actual mitigation research. Um, and so this is us looking into ways, how, what can we do when red tide happens, when we have a bloom of red tide? There's a couple of things that you want to consider with that, of course, because we can't just, you know, back in the 50s, they tried to get rid of red tide with copper sulfate, which they dumped onto the water. And oh, wow. is it, it kills everything, not oh. just red tide. And yeah. so obviously we we have to do mitigation where we're not causing more harm. It's the number one rule. Right. And so we have to find these very strategic, very specific ways to get rid of the cells of red tide, also get rid of the toxin in the water, and not cause any further damage or further harm mm -hmm. or affect the environment in either way. So it's a it's very specific, very important uh, list of things to do in that realm. But we have a lot of cool... Um, creative ways we're trying to look at um, ways that we can mitigate red tides. One of which we tested out in canals in the Boca Grande area um, of just using a, an ozone system. And so we'll bring in the water, go send it through the ozone, which kills the, the toxins and the red tide cells. And then we're able to you know, filter that water back and put it back in the canal. But this is that's so cool. something that's effective. Yeah. And it's something that's effective for like a small dead end canal where you're right. not getting a lot of water flow right. and things like that. It's, you know, and that's the other part of, of our red tide research is, is the scale. Um, you know, we're really targeting things that can help people, especially. So things like a dead end canal that might get just kind of just overrun with red tide. It doesn't have a lot of water flow. We do a lot of things as well for kind of just public awareness. So we have our um, visit beaches.org website, which is where people can go to see current conditions at the beach and since red tide can be quite patchy, you might one beach might have dead fish and respiratory irritation, but another beach 10 miles away doesn't. And so this is a good resource for people to check out before they go to the beach um, right. and you know kind of see which beach is for them. And we had no idea that this past year it would also be used because one of the things that's on visitbeaches.org is crowds. And so now all of a sudden this tool also became extremely important for people that yeah. were looking to get outside and away from crowds. So they could go on there and see what beach was not as crowded as others. So it's, it's a really cool tool. And we, you know, we developed it for Red Tide um, to, you know, kind of notify the public about what was going on with Red Tide. And now it's being used for other things, which is really cool. <laughs> That's so cool. Nice. The best innovations work out that way. Yeah. <laughs> sure. So the Gulf is definitely a lot calmer and smaller mm -hmm. than the Atlantic. Uh, right, and, right. you know, us here, we love our sea creatures, <laughs> yeah. uh, mm -hmm. you know, are there still like a lot of animals and creatures that call the Gulf home? Yeah, we have we have some really cool animals that live in the Gulf of Mexico, and I think um, you know whale sharks is one of the is one Super of cool. you know those those bucket list um, animals that people are 
you know, um, you know, whenever there's a video of a fisherman offshore that sees a whale shark, that always goes viral. It seems like mm-hmm. um, we do some of our research um, with whale sharks in the Gulf of Mexico. And um, I, well, another really cool thing that I don't think a lot of people realize um, is Sarasota County is the um, most dense nesting for loggerhead sea turtles in the entire Gulf wow. of Mexico. Wow. Yeah, and then when you look at Florida as a whole, when you look at both coasts, Florida is one of the top two places in the world for loggerhead sea turtles to nest. That's so cool. And so our beaches are super important for for these animals. And um, we're getting ready. To, I know I know we're going to talk about it a little bit, but um, we are getting ready for sea turtle nesting season. But yes. there's a county is one of the most important nesting habitats for sea turtles in the entire Gulf of Mexico. Um, we're just so lucky to have that here. Yeah. yeah. So since since you teased it a little bit, you know, we definitely <laughs> wanted to talk about sea turtles. I think you know, for us, yeah. you know, a lot of our listeners are either traveling through Florida already or thinking about coming mm-hmm. here. And I, I know for me, mm-hmm. uh, I used to work on Marco Island, and I actually came from okay. the East Coast myself, so I wasn't that familiar with all the sea turtle nesting. And I know that you know we had to you know, change some of the lights outside for sea turtle season. You know, we have to make Mm -hmm. sure that all of our curtains are drawn for sea turtle season. So can you tell us Mm -hmm. a little bit more about the life cycle of a sea turtle and why it's so important that we follow those guidelines? Yeah. Yeah. And so I I do want to just clarify, realizing that you have um, listeners across Florida, we're getting ready to start sea turtle nesting season here on the west coast of florida but the east coast has already started oh um and so yeah sea turtles um come onto the east coast a little bit earlier so they already have nests over there um so it's just important for folks to you know look up what their local ordinances are for beachfront properties or you know beach adjacent properties um and you know lighting is certainly the number one of the number one issues for for sea turtles is is artificial lighting um, and the long and the short of it is that when a hatchling emerges from the nest, they go towards the brightest horizon. And we want that to be the moon on the water. But when we have a cloudy night or when lights are not turned out and things like that, that can, you know, they can go the opposite way. And we call that a disorientation. And the reason why disorientations are so, you know, detrimental to sea turtle hatchlings is when they come out of the nest they have a very limited amount of energy that they need to use up in their frenzy towards the water we literally call it a swim frenzy <laughs> um and so if they're going the wrong way they're west- wasting that limited energy they have um and so they're going the wrong way they we oftentimes find hatchlings that have ended up in people's pools Aww. stuck under patio furniture um extreme cases where we might see them end up in um roads and parking lots and and, they're so um, tiny they are extremely tiny you know and they're wasting energy going the wrong way which puts them in harm of predators um so things like raccoons coyotes um uh sea turtle hatching is a great snack for them unfortunately Uh, unfortunately for the turtle right um and so we don't want turtles wasting their energy um and putting themselves you know becoming more likely to be predated on. Um, so we want them to go towards the water. That's why lighting is a huge thing. Um, just general debris on the beach is also a problem. They can, you know, uh, these heads, I mean, they are so tiny. They fit in the palm of your hand. Mm-hmm. You know, they're smaller than the palm of your hand. A, a solo cup on the beach can trap a sea turtle. You know, it's, I mean, they're, they're tiny. Even um, things like if you're digging holes on the beach because you're building a sandcastle, you don't fill in your holes. We get, these turtle hatchlings that have gotten trapped in deep footprints before. Yeah, I never even thought um, about that. Yeah, I mean, they're tiny. Right. Um, a sandcastle can literally be like a That's massive so obstacle. Um, and so, you know, we just tell people, leave the beach as natural as you can. So pick up your trash, knock down your sandcastle, fill in your holes, bring in your beach furniture, things like that. Um, we also get females will get trapped. Um, they'll get stuck in things like beach furniture they'll mm-hmm. literally get it like the, a chair stuck on their back if you leave your beach furniture out and things like that so just That's leaving right. the beach as natural as possible is the best thing you can do lighting debris furniture sand castles any of those kind of things just make yeah. it look like it looked when you know sea turtles were here 400 million years ago 
Yeah, I'm an avid sad sandcastle <laughs> builder, and that thought literally never crossed my mind. And now I'm like, oh my gosh, mm-hmm. I've put so many baby sea turtles in danger. So I will be knocking down every sandcastle I see. There you go. Next, there you I'm going to be like Godzilla out there at the beach. Yeah, yeah. perfect. <laughs> well, piggybacking off of you know what we can do to help, you know what what yeah. do you find are like the greatest you know contributing factors to uh, reef loss in the Gulf? Um. Yeah. So. In um, the Florida Keys, so if we're kind of, you know, the connecting between the, the Gulf and the Atlantic and the Florida Keys, um, we, we're we so lucky that Florida has um, the U.S.'s only continental barrier, you know, the continental U.S.'s only barrier reef is right down in Florida. Um, and our barrier reef is the third largest barrier reef in the entire world is in the Florida Keys. Mm-hmm. And so we have this beautiful jewel it's in our backyard. Um, and as you... As we know, Floridians that are dependent on a tourism-based economy, Florida Keys brings in some some good tourists. So we need that reef for our economy, for our well-being, um, and our ocean needs it. And so the Florida Keys, the reef, has had a very interesting past. It, you know, a lot of degradation happened due to poor water quality over time. We've had some pretty severe um, disease events over time. And so when you look at the, in the past 50 years, living coral cover in the Florida Keys has declined from about 50% living coral cover to some places have 1% to 2% living coral wow. cover in the Florida Keys. So we're talking severe, severe loss. And, you know, many would consider especially parts of the reef to be essentially functionally extinct. Um, and so we're talking that, you know, major losses. Um, and right now we're actually dealing with another extreme disease event called stony coral tissue loss disease. And this is a disease that affects the massive and bouldering corals. So the backbone of the reef um, and is extremely deadly to about 20 species of coral on the reef um, and has been just kind of spreading throughout the entire reef track for the last several years. Um, and so it's it's in it's in it is in dire straits. But there are definitely things that we are we're doing to help. Um, you know, Mo is one organization that is kind of leading the way in coral restoration. Um, we have several other partners, and we partner with um, NOAA, which is our federal agency that manages the reef and things like that. Um, but we're growing coral on land um, and in our underwater nurseries and planting them back onto the reef. Um, so there is. There is hope yet. <laughs> I don't want to end on that bad note, but I don't want to sugarcoat with, you know, a pretty serious situation, um, unfortunately, in the Florida Keys. But we we are working to turn it around. We just, we got to keep moving. <laughs> yeah, it's, and something that we talk about a lot, because I think with, with issues, especially when we're talking about our environment, that can seem uh-huh. so daunting, you know, when you talk about 49%, uh-huh. you know, loss of, the reef. Uh-huh. Uh, and, you know, I learned a little bit in researching for this episode how long it can take for certain reefs yep. to grow, like yeah. the the yeah. black coral specifically we talked a little bit about today. Uh, and something that we talk about all the time is small things that you can do, like reef-safe sunscreen or eco-safe sunscreen. Uh, I've heard some anecdotes where if you use, like, the, the aerosol spray sun creams, even, even if you're just at the pool and not at the beach, that it can travel two miles uh, and kill coral. Do you have any insight on how true that is? So our studies on the effects of sunscreen have been in a laboratory setting, and we do see that, um, you know, oxybenzone, oxybiocinate um, can affect um, coral. It really depends on the formulation as well. Um, but that's in a, in a laboratory setting. And so when you're talking about how the sunscreen is affecting the entire reef and the huge ecosystem it is, it, there's not very much data um, or research about the effect of sunscreen on corals on the reef. We know that it can have a negative effect in the lab. And so if people are concerned about their sunscreen, you know, I don't want to tell people to not go to the beach and not, you know, And have to fully cover themselves up, but you got to protect yourself against the sun, right? Mm -hmm. So physical coverings like, you know, shirts, especially if you're out on a boat, shirts, buffs, things like that, of course, are good protective. You want to wear a zinc oxide-based sunscreen. That's something you can do as well. 
But, you know, when we're looking at the effects of disease climate change on our reefs, you know, these are these are the, the major huge effects on climate on on our coral reefs. So if people want to make a difference for for corals, it's, you know, it's we have to, you know, take big action in limiting carbon carbon footprint. Um, cause that's what's causing, you know, rising ocean temperatures and decreasing pH. And those have a negative effect on coral reefs. Um, you know, it's been a long time of improving the water quality of Florida Bay and the waters around Florida Keys. And that's been a big thing. It's um, a big thing to combat these massive disease events like what we have right now. The entire 350 miles of the Florida Keys Reef Tract, you know, is being affected by disease right now. And wow. so we're working to combat the disease and better understand this disease and what we could do for corals on the reef so you know when we're looking at some of these um you know the things affecting the reef there are some the major things affecting the reef right now so a little bit of a pivot but i think that this is one more of those ways that our listeners can try to give back and help you guys in your mission mm -hmm. uh and like mm -hmm. i said we've got a lot of people that live right here in sunny florida and i was really excited when i was on your website and i learned that you can actually support moat and our reefs and make your car look a little bit cooler uh by yeah. getting one of your license plates so tell us more about that yeah so um you know in florida we have a lot of specialty license plates um uh, but there's like a million them, i know i know <laughs> Um, apparently other states don't have this. Yeah, I've learned Florida, that. So, um, and so we, um, Moat Marine Laboratory, um, operates the, um, protect our reefs license plate. And so this license plate is $25 a year for the specialty plate. And that $25, um, comes back to Mo, and then we're able to, it helps fund our, um, our keys facility down, in, um, the keys where we do all of our, um, restoration operations. And then, so it, partially funds that and then we also distribute those funds through various grants for people working in florida on coral reefs so whether it's a research restoration or even education we've done some education grants and things like that um you know we're able to do that every year um we do those grants every year as well through the protect our reefs license plate and you're you know it's a form of raising awareness you're driving around with this license plate and right you know hopefully people will wonder what's this plate about and they'll land on our website and learn about coral reefs and you can roll your window down and talk about it when you're stuck in <laughs> yeah, miami exactly. traffic or something yeah i love that <laughs> You know, like, as you said, you can't sugarcoat it. Like, we know the reefs are struggling, which is why I love that you have a focus on education because it really is the best way to sustain and exponentially mm -hmm. grow the positive effects of all of your research. And then I did see that there's even a new facility on the horizon. So tell us about that. Yeah. Um, this is a great way to bring us back to the beginning of our conversation about our founder, Dr. Eugenie Clark. Eugenie Clark got a lot of her inspiration as a kid going to the New York Aquarium. And so her inspiration for fish and sharks was her experience going to the aquarium. And so we really take that to heart at Mo, and we believe that, uh, you know, a fun educational experience at our aquarium is something that can really inspire the next generation of scientists. We also have a big emphasis on quality research internship experiences for college grads and, and undergrads um, so they can become, you know, high quality next generation of scientists as well and so tying that all together our new facility is the new um will be the moat science education aquarium and for those of you who've never come to visit us at moat in sarasota we are on a beautiful island but we are on a small island um and so our lab space and our aquarium space we've run out of space we're on a small island and to expand the way we need to to continue our research to bring in more scientists to bring more kids through the door of the aquarium we will be moving the aquarium to a new location um and then the old location will just will have all that free space for more research space so we'll be transforming that campus into even more research space that's awesome the new aquarium will be um the science education aquarium will be um near i-75 um and so it'll be a little bit easier for a lot of people to access um, a lot more people will actually have an easier time accessing it. We're a little closer to the highway, so we're able to reach um, a little broader audience. And it's also um, a little bit easier for a lot of our schools and, um, you know, community groups and things like that to reach than where we are on our on our little island um, <laughs> right now. So it will be we'll really be able to expand our reach with that new facility. It's going to be right near the highway as well. And it's um, 
going to look really cool. So just also the people driving by, they're going to be like, what's that? Um, we'll get to reach those people as well. I can't wait to see it. Do you have like a tentative opening time frame? Yeah. So we are, um, we just broke ground recently and we're getting ready to start vertical construction. Once we finish some of our land, um, you know, our kind of surface construction, um, we'll hopefully be able to start um, that vertical construction sometime this year. And then building a brand new aquarium from the ground up is not an overnight project. We're looking at about two to three years of um, construction time once we start vertical construction. Well, we'll be there. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> <Yes>. Awesome. <Great. laughs> Absolutely. And I'm sure everybody listening at home is now, what do I do about the sea turtles? How can I help the reefs? What about dolphins? <laughs> yeah. uh, so tell us where we can get a little bit more information about what you guys do and where everyone can find you on social media. Yeah. Um, so our website is www.moat.org. So M-O-T-E dot O-R-G. Um, we have a lot of cool stuff on our website. If you want to check in on the sea turtles, once sea turtle nesting season starts here on the on the west coast of Florida, we post our weekly nesting numbers so you can follow along. Um, you can follow along with our hospital patients in our turtle hospital. Um, we didn't even get a chance to talk about that yet, but we have a hospital. You can follow along with your favorite patients and see how they're doing there. Um, so that's on our website. And then on all social media platforms, we're at Moat Marine Lab. And you can always do hashtag Moat Marine Lab as well. I love it. And it sounds like uh, you've got more to share. So we're going to have to invite you on again. Yes. Okay. <laughs> For sure yeah. when the new aquarium opens. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, but it'll definitely. have to be it'll have to be before that. Stephanie with two ends. Thank you so much for coming on yeah. and joining us today. And we hope you have a great sea turtle season and uh, a great rest of your weekend. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, well, Stephanie with two ends was cool. Yes. Yeah. Right. We totally have to have her on again and we have to go oh, to yeah. moat. And I oh, want that license plate. Thinking yeah, about like too. how expensive the, the, the building of an aquarium can be like, right. you know, how, like thick the glasses with those right. huge slabs glass. of glass. Right. Like that alone has got to be worth a fortune. No so. kidding. You should definitely get that license plate. Yeah. More to do in Sarasota now. Uh, so we're going to take a quick break, maybe freshen up our glasses. Uh, and then when we get back, we're going to do some fun segments for you guys. So hang cool. tight. <laughs> And we're back. Welcome to part three. Is it is it a part? It's the end. No, what, it's, well, it's the beginning I mean, of the end. We've only been of our episode. For like Thirty minutes deep dive. And, well, that's just the interview. Oh, never mind. Yeah, we've been we've been going hard. Uh, like this that's why we call it a deep dive into the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. Yeah. So now that we know all about the Gulf, the beaches, yeah. all that stuff, yeah. like that's the science. Mm. You know what I mean? But let's have some fun. Yes. Okay. Because right? the beach is, it's beach time. It's warming up. Oh, I think God, we might even wait. go to the beach this weekend. I uh, but I thought we could uh, educate our listeners on how to have a fun time at the beach with tips and dip. Tips and really? dip. Tips and dip. Tips and dip. Tips and dip. Mmm, tips and dip. Tips and dip. Tips and dip. It's been a while since we've done tips it and tips. Why, why did we stop? Yeah, I was like, I don't know I don't because know. So I feel like our episodes have turned into like an hour's worth of tips and dip. Sure. Uh, but this was informative, so I thought it'd be fun to flank it with some tips and dip. Uh, so earlier in the week, I tasked our very own Megan and Garrett with what did I say? How to have a great beach day. I said, Megan and Garrett, you guys love the beach. Uh, why don't you tell our listeners at home some things that you think make up a great beach day? All right, I'll start, and this one is pretty specific. Okay. If you want to have a good beach day, I mean, like a real, I, I'm somebody that I have to have a place. Like, I don't like lying on towels. Yo, I yes, have to have a 100%. Chair. What and are you, the a baby? The only chair huh? that I am ever going to bring to the beach ever again, the Tommy Bahama. <laughs> Tommy Bahama beach chair. Yes. <laughs> yes. Fashionable. Yeah. Fashionable. Affordable. You got af affordable. Uh -huh. You've got cup holders you yep. got pockets yep. for your phone yep. for your your wallet you have an insulated an insulated thing. little yes. cooler yeah. if you yes. don't bring a, a cooler cool. actually mm -hmm. second thing was bring a cooler but <laughs> if you don't if you forget a cooler or and like that's gonna yeah. hold like one drink like like four it's a couple you right, even we'll put ice in there. Drink. yeah it depends on yeah it's not gonna put your bottle of tequila but, yeah so you know, no glass it's mm -hmm. the best chair i've ever owned 
Yeah. For the beach. It's great. And, it and, completely reclines to like a and, flat, yes. totally flat. I, you can honestly, lay out and tan on it. Who right. cares about I a towel? I wish right. I had that chair when I was in high school because all my friends were just like, yeah, we'll just bring towels. I'm right. Like, no. Ugh, I hate that. Right. And then you what get all sandy. My back support. Then I have to find right. a crappy chair and like, What about my, my lumbar spine? <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. I hate it. My hate spine. It. <laughs> so where can you get these chairs, Garrett? You can get them at Costco. Mm-hmm. That's the cheapest place that I've seen. Yep. Right? But obviously TommyBahama.com. Obvi- obviously nope. Tommy Bahama. Mm-hmm. So here's the deal. Here's the difference. Tommy Bahama and TommyBahama.com has the chairs with the wooden arms. Oh, I don't. They're yeah. a little bit more expensive. Yeah. They also have a higher back. So they're ah, a little bit sturdier. Okay. The ones at Costco have plastic arms, but they're still, I mean, they're not they're like great. rickety plastic. They're, they're hard great. plastic. I mean, we take them out in the sun every year and they hold up. You can also get them on Amazon. Oh, so, you know, that, that one two day shipping. We'll Pretty go ahead sweet. and put a link in the show notes if you want to purchase that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Ten Tommy out of ten. Bahama also, Tommy Big Bahama fan. umbrella. Yeah, that Tommy was, Bahama yeah, beach set. That. Highly recommended umbrella mm-hmm. because just like she said, you don't want to be like covering your whole body. Yep. In sunscreen, it's not good for the reefs. Mm-hmm. Quick or thing, the marine life in general. Mm-hmm. Before I started dating you, I never once brought an umbrella to. Uh, to the beach and it's a game changer you need relief from the sun you need it right you need if you don't bring an umbrella you just need to leave sooner yeah because you're a gonna game die changer. so you can stay like all day if you have some shade it's beautiful mm-hmm. get your yeah, sun I, in yeah, then but it. maybe we'll post a tutorial on how to uh, <laughs> plant your umbrella in the sand. so hold on so this might be a great little like teaser for something that i have on the horizon <sighs> when i go to the beach yeah <laughs> we have a lot of i mean Honestly, it's locals and travelers alike where you can just sit back and recline maybe at like a a 45 degree angle in your Tommy Bahama beach chair and watch all the people try to put their umbrellas in the sand. And it is absolute mayhem. It is. Yeah. No one gets it. Right. It's pretty. It, first of all, you want to get. I don't think get, it's that hard. It's not that hard. Listen, can I say something really Please. Quick? Please. Look, I'm, I'm telling you right now, the wiggling it back and forth, <laughs> left to right, That's front not doing and anything. back. That's not doing anything. It's, 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 it's making, making it worse. way worse. It's making it worse. You're making it's, a bigger hole. <laughs> you know what you need to do when you start going back to the beach? Start sending the videos of people putting umbrellas in the, in the ground. Yeah. To our Instagram. Send page, them. So we can put them on our story. But here's the thing. Please I do. have a photo album in my phone called Beach Umbrella Compilation. And I have been accruing this content, this sick content for the right moment to release it. I nice. think this might nice. be it. Perfect. Yeah. I think We've this might be it. we go flying. Yeah. And it's dangerous. It's not just like hilarious for me to watch you put it in, but it's also really dangerous. A you strong can impale someone. You, you people have been impaled by beach umbrellas. Facts. These are facts. Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah, because they go, the wind will take the umbrella at, right up and out of the sand, and then it'll, like, swoosh, like, do, like, a, a spear-type motion right into, like, a baby's chest. Do you want to oh be responsible God. for that? I'm just saying. What like, if it's to be a baby's chest? It could be a fully grown chest. But <laughs> I mean, it probably would it pierce could be a baby's man chest. chest it but it's very dangerous. Sure. Isn't it dangerous, producer, when the beach umbrellas go flying? Deadly. See, you heard it here first. To a baby. Don't be deadly. Have fun at the beach. This is how to have a deadly beach day. This is how to have a really fun beach day. So, yeah. Um, I already touched on this one a little bit. Uh, Wait, it's not your turn. You just said the beach umbrella. I guess. Oh, okay. No, I thought that was yours. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Fine. fine. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I I didn't realize that was. Listen. Go ahead. I love marine life. Who doesn't? I love it. Yeah. It's my favorite part of the beach, especially if you're not from Florida. Like, get in there. Like, get in with those sea critters. Yeah, don't be scared. Like, I agree. Mm-hmm. Unless you're at New Smyrna Beach to shark Listen, bike at. I'm we'll born and raised in Florida, and I have never seen a shark in the water. I have. Oh, really? That doesn't mean they're not there. They oh, might they're, be oh, there. Oh, they're there. Mm-hmm. One thing I will say is avoid the drop-off. You'll know when you get there. You avoid. will. Yeah. Um... But oh, I God, recommend bringing like a net or like a little like Ooh, like yeah, a good clear one. bowl because mm-hmm. one there's a lot of li- living creatures in the seaweed. So if you can get like living seaweed and you can like yeah. shake it out into a little bowl, like I found fish in there, a little shrimp, a bowl with water in it. Yeah, a bowl yeah. with water in mm-hmm. it. To be clear, you don't want to kill them. Mm-hmm. Um, and a net because you can you know catch little things. You know you never know and when you're going to examine them. Yeah, and then return them back Absolutely. to right. the water. Return them back. Especially yeah. if you have kids, it's going to blow their minds. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's really cool. You can find like little shrimps. Little we we found like a little. Uh, was it a puffer fish? I don't know. It was a tiny little fish once. That a little we tiny black fish. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Never identified so cool. it. <laughs> yeah. Never, we have an, We should get Stephanie with two ends back on here yeah. to identify the fish that we got. Call her right now. Yeah. Cool. What else you got? I already kind of touched on this one when I said bring a cooler, but I'm going to kind of add a little to it. Okay. Bring a cooler that's easy to carry. 
Good one. Or wheels. Enough, uh, wheels. But enough room wheels. to where you have enough alcohol or sodas or water. Water. Right Definitely more the water. Day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, but that's lame. That's, like, everybody, you should have it, like, just we, we as should much not water. Have, water and the sun not, like, sucks the water We should water not out have to remind you uh-huh. to bring water, you crazy people. But so, some people don't realize because here's the thing. When you go to the beach and, like up north... It's co- it's not so hot. The yeah. water's cold. Like it's pretty hard to get dehydrated. But yeah, you could true. be outside for like Megan knows you were outside today for a couple hours without mm-hmm. water. That was yeah? too. Yeah. And you look sick. <laughs> Great. <Aww. laughs> Thanks. I think you I'm, look kidding. I'm in full makeup, by the way. <laughs> uh, no, I, 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 the worst thing ever is bringing a cooler that is either you need two people to carry it or it's mm-hmm. just so heavy to carry by itself. Yep. I've done that before where Me I've too. had to walk down a beach with a full like Yeti, like 110 <laughs> cooler with right. hold, somebody else holding it with me. It is it's awful. miserable. Yeah. So get a, maybe a backpack cooler, like yep. one of those big, bigger backpack coolers or one with a uh, wheels. Wheels is tough just because sometimes the sand kind of messes it up. Yeah. I have a beach cart mm-hmm. that I can put the cooler in. I can put the chairs in and Real like quick. balance. What brand is that beach? Cart? Also Tommy Bahama. <laughs> If we haven't mentioned it enough, you need Tommy Bahama everything. I'm wearing Tommy a Tommy Bahama. Bahama shirt right now. Yes. Yeah. I'm wearing Tommy Bahama shoes right now. Also, Tommy Bahama has a new Disney club. Are you anyway, kidding me? Yeah. This, this Are is you not a Tommy Bahama me? episode, but when is it not? But Tommy maybe we should just do a Tommy Bahama episode. We need them on. Jeez. All right. Cool. Anything else? Um. <gasps> Bluetooth speaker. Yeah, speaker. Oh, yeah. Oh, Bring God, that's a good one. You might Bluetooth have, like, a speaker, speaker. war, but win you it. Might. Just win the war. Just win it. Yeah, yeah win Be the respectful. War. Of course. Right? Then. Like, sound shouldn't carry that far yeah. at the beach. Like, if you can hear it outside of your real estate yeah. area, then you're say, being a jerk. If you're, if you're like, in the area, somebody else is playing a Bluetooth speaker, and you're like, oh, hey, their music isn't bad. Maybe just be respectful if they were there before you. Yeah, maybe just leave it yeah. or find another spot. Yeah. You know? Just sometimes speaker wars annoy the other person. Speaker wars. Yeah. Cool. This one's not like essential, but it is like a lot of fun, and mm. that is like a big float. Oh god! Like I, you know, Pablo. We have a, yeah, a, a big sea turtle name? named Pablo, Pablo, and you yeah. can just like sit on him, mm-hmm. and it's like it's a vibe. You can get some cool Instagram pics, you know? Yeah, know. get a little yeah. inner tube. Just make sure um, you don't go out into the ocean. Yeah. Like, make sure you have a, a buddy that you're using as an anchor. Absolutely, you know? don't do it alone. Yeah. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, don't yeah. do it alone. Don't go tubing alone. It, you know, as we all know, a. Uh, sh- uh, a turtle shaped float from the bottom <laughs> looks like a seal. Are there seals in the Gulf no. of Mexico? Or a turtle. Or a turtle. Or a turtle shaped float. A turtle shaped shark like a seal. Uh-huh. 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 Like a toodle. Right. A toodle? A turtle? A turtle? It's a toodle. It's a toodle. A toodle. I like turtle. Maybe a snack? What about a snack? Oh, a good snack. Uh, oh, my God. You know what? I know I know exactly you know what, what we did. It, 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 it is good. It was good. Incredible. We brought. Jimmy John sandwiches last time we went to the beach. I don't know how you could eat a sandwich at the beach. I mean, it's as so, a child. It's like kind of like a cold like, one, like a fresh like a cold, cold, like a cold uh-huh. cut. No, sandwich. I get it. I want to eat a sandwich immediately following the beach. I don't like oh, we the struggle. No, like it was wrapped perfectly. So yeah. you literally just like kind of open it up. You it know, I, per- oh, mm. God, I gotta say, mm. I, whenever I think of Jimmy John's, I just think of the CEO or the owner, or the founder. <laughs> Laying nude with like a tuna. Grinning nude band. Grinning nude band with like a dead shark. I'm yeah. pretty sure it was a shark. Yeah. So it's so like maybe, maybe we should boycott like, Jimmy. Yeah. You know what? Don't get Jimmy John's. But maybe a cool Public sandwich. sub? But one in Rome? No, that's after. Public sub, one in Rome. Public. Well, listen, you don't have to get a chicken under sub at the beach. You can get <laughs> any other Megan. kind of meat. I like to bring like cold fruit. Something no. cold. Definitely Definitely not upset. Yeah, it has to be cold. Can everybody say it with me? Mm. No, maybe watermelon. Like a kale salad? No. You, do you want? Do you bring your chia seeds as well, Steph? <laughs> and your blender to blend it all up, make right. a smoothie at the yeah. beach? Yeah, I, I, like, I like a nice green cold-pressed juice while I'm at the beach. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. <laughs> but I'll bring some fresh coconut. For sure. Yeah, but <laughs> also be aware, you know, we've been talking about things to bring and not to bring. Every beach has its own things you can have, things you cannot have, like glass or alcohol or dogs or cars. Uh, so make sure you check the rules mm-hmm. before you get out to the beach that you're going to. Or ask us and we'll tell you. Maybe. Cool. Maybe if we uh, like you. So I had one more surprise. Oh. Ooh. And one more surprise. Uh, I thought since... Beach days are so fun mm-hmm. that we could do a game time. Uh oh. I'm mad. I wasn't prepared. <laughs> I wasn't either. <laughs> it's right. You never know. You almost you never know. know. I can't believe that's you, Steph. Welcome to another episode of Game Time, hosted by me, Steph with one N. 
I guess it's Stephanie with one N. It's because Steph has no ends. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so this game time episode is going to be all about, you guessed it, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh-oh. Are you guys ready? Uh-oh. Sure. So I've been thinking about this because every game time we do like a special. Yeah. First of all, (laughs) Megan Megan is not a. uh, Is it a? It's a sore loser. Megan is a sore loser. Number one. Uh, And number two. uh, Yeah. And she's still mad when she wins. Yeah. It's bizarre. No matter what, when we play game time, Megan gets mad. She's like, "You beat me. and I'm really pissed off. You let me. You let me win. and (laughs) I'm really pissed off." (laughs) But you have to make a sound appropriate to the. (laughs) <laughs> to the episode. So I was thinking you have two options. One, you can either go blub, 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 like because you're like you're under the water or you could put a which this will be just for me, not our friends at home. You could put your hand on top of your head like a fin and like you can a, go Dun-na, like that. What about like a oh What's like, that? A, like a sea lion, you know. Sea, oh, sea lions are in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. I guess. Yeah. But they're in the not a ocean. Pacific what about, ocean. What what about a, episode? a, a seagull? Ah, Wait, ah, yeah, that ah, works. Ah, okay. Um, all right. Ah, okay. Ah, Wait. So you're going to be seagulls? I wish I could sure. make like a dolphin sound. It's too hard. <laughs> it sounds like a sheep. All right. So whatever you do, it has to be okay. like the Gulf of Mexico. Are we both just I doing have seagulls? to believe that you do I'm, dolphin. At, I'm at the Gulf. I, okay. That's harder to do. <laughs> I'll, do I'll do dolphin. We'll yeah. both do dolphin. How about that? No. I want someone to be a seagull. Okay. I'll do seagull. Cricket's over here like, what the hell is happening? All right. All right go ahead. Here we go. First question. What other states border the Gulf of Mexico? <laughs> Is that a dolphin? Um, um, Alabama. Uh-huh. Uh Alabama. Uh huh. Louisiana. Yep. Uh, Texas. Yep. It's one more. R. N- <laughs> <laughs> I know. There's I, one more. You should use tick tock. Texas. What am I missing? Dude. Mississippi? That's it! Nice. Woo! nice job. Very good. Very good nice. Mississippi. Very I nice. I thought you didn't like geography. I've never been known for my geography. Did you almost but say hey. Arkansas? No. Because <laughs> that's nowhere that's not near. Right. I was thinking like a pirate. Anyway. That is quite landlocked. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, what is the most valued commercial species to come out of the Gulf of Mexico? Ah! Garrett? Tuna? Wrong. Damn it. Megan for the seal. Um, sponge. False. It's oh. shrimp. I had to say shrimp, but we had a sponge like fiasco, like fiesta last episode. Oh, that yeah. Was last no. Episode. Yeah. You're right. That was a good guess. Nice job. Uh, all right. So nobody gets that one. I'll give it to Cricket. All right. The Gulf holds 643 quadrillion gallons of water. That's a lot. That is a lot. Uh, but how deep does it get at its furthest point? This is multiple choice. 120 feet. 1,200 feet, or 12,000 feet? <laughs> Megan? <laughs> 1,200 feet. Wrong. Oh! Ah! Garrett? 12,000 feet. 12,000 feet! <laughs> it gets 12, how are you going to put a whale shark in 1,200 12, feet? 000. Well, I mean... <laughs> no, that's not it? how this works. All right, we've got <laughs> one point for what Garrett. What was the first answer? 120. Okay. Yeah. Thank God. I We've got one. one point for Garrett, one point for Megan, one point for Cricket. It's anybody's game. Oh, whale shark would be fine until it's feet. <laughs> uh, most things yeah. would. Yeah. Uh, okay, here we go. 40% of the continental U.S., the entire landmass between the Appalachian and Rocky Mountains, covering 31 straits, or excuse me, states, drains into these waters. 33 major rivers drain into the Gulf, the largest of which is... Ah! Garrett? Mississippi. That is correct. The Mississippi <laughs> River. The Mississippi oh, River. Two points for Garrett, one point for Megan. D- one measly point for Cricket. I'm already angry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. The Gulf of Mexico boasts incredible biodiversity. We talked a lot about that today. Scientists have inventoried 15,000. 419 species in the Gulf ecosystem, ranking it in the top five oceans globally. Residents including hundreds of species of fish, hundreds more of crustaceans, four species of whale, and 28 species of dolphin, with the largest concentration of this type of dolphin found in U.S. waters. What dolphin? (coughs) Megan? Bottlenose dolphin? That is correct. <laughs> boom! Bottlenose well, she, dolphin. I couldn't have given boom. That one it's the through. only dolphin I can name. <laughs> <laughs> There's a uh, Commerce dolphin. dolphins. Oh, I do know the There's Amazon, Amazon River Paint dolphins. dolphins. Yeah, those are yeah, they're so, so freaky. Is that what they're actually called? I yeah. do know them. No. They're freaky looking, man. It's like if you took 
uh, a fetus of a bottlenose dolphin and made it full grown. Ugh. Yeah. It's really gross. <laughs> but I'm sure they're lovely. Here we go. I don't know. So that's two for Megan, two for Garrett? Wow. Okay. Here we go. The Gulf is home to at least 49 shark species. Mm. This, That's right. <laughs> this species is the second smallest shark in the hammerhead family, averaging 30 to 48 inches long with a maximum reported total length of 59 inches. They can weigh up to 24 <laughs> pounds. What shark am I? That was me. <laughs> I think it was. Ah, I think it was Garrett. <laughs> I know this. Is it a bonnet head? It is a bonnet Grr! head. They're freaking adorable. We I love you, bonnet heads. My friend once caught one. and uh, I pictured him catching him with his teeth for some reason. Like, I don't just know like, why. Dunking? I don't know why. Pulling it out. I don't know why. <laughs> okay. But, uh, you know, it was kind of in you know one of the last two. It was, it was, just, it was a small bonnet mm-hmm. head. Mm-hmm. And he was like, he was putting it back in. He's like, bye, bonnet head. Bonnet. Bull shark ate it. <gasps> no! <laughs> That's As it was like swimming away. That's so sad. Oh, they're so cute. It's because they smell the blood. All right. Uh, this one, just to make things interesting, it's worth 12 points. Okay. Here we go. Well, b- that's how it's <laughs> so my it's rules. Winning, my game, winning. my rules. Winning question right here. Manatees that can be found in the Gulf of Mexico can reach up to 12 feet in length. They can weigh over 1,500 pounds, and they recently came off the endangered species list. Nice. But guys, no. where are their nipples? Megan? Under their armpits? Under their armpits! 12 points, nice. Megan. Nice job. Woo-hoo. There we go. This is it. It is my day. <laughs> it's Megan's turn. All right, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to Just a Podcast in Paradise. We are so happy that you hung out with us today. We would love it if you would subscribe so you don't miss an episode and give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts so we can continue to work hard to make your next Florida vacation the most memorable trip you've ever had. You can also follow us on Instagram at Just Take a Dip for daily updates on what's happening around Florida and check out our YouTube channel Just a Day in Paradise for destination ideas restaurant reviews unboxing things you might want to take on your next trip and copycat recipes from some of our favorite places in paradise we're wishing you a little bit of sunshine wherever you are and we hope to see you in paradise soon say goodbye guys goodbye, goodbye everybody Tommy Bahama sponsor us Tommy Bahama sponsor us Tommy Bahama 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 Tommy